morning, everyone. Good morning. I'm reading from Luke 25 to 35. Now there was a man in Jerusalem called Simeon, who was righteous and devout. He was waiting for the consolation of Israel, and the Holy Spirit was upon him. It had been revealed to him by the Holy Spirit that he would not die before he had seen the Lord's Christ. Moved by what he had seen, <clears throat> excuse me, moved by the Spirit, he went into the temple courts. When the parents brought in the child Jesus to do for him the custom of the law, <coughs> law required, Simeon took him in his arms and praised God, saying, Sovereign Lord, as you have promised, you now dismiss your servant in peace. For my eyes have seen your salvation, which you have prepared in the sight of all people, a light for revelation to the Gentiles and for glory to your people Israel. The child's father and mother marveled at what was said about him. Then Simeon blessed him, blessed them, to, and said, to marry his mother, this child is destined to cause the falling and rising of many in Israel, and to be a sign that will be spoken against, so that the thoughts of many parts will be revealed, and the sword will pierce your own soul too. Yeah, this is the word of the Lord. Thank you. So uh, when I was uh, younger, and I imagine this is true for you too, when I was younger, I just really wanted to fit in. You know, there's that, like, different circles that you get put in. You just, like, really want to fit in. Everybody wants to, to fit in. I felt uh, especially this strong desire to fit in because when I was younger, first through eighth grade, I was homeschooled. Now, uh, this was before homeschooling was kind of a cool and popular thing that it is today. I know several of you in here uh, are homeschooled or were homeschooled or your parents homeschool you. This was back when everyone was like, homeschool, like, what does that even mean? You know, you're just going to know all the stuff your mom does. You know, but, but yeah, there was this, this time where um, I, just, I didn't want people to associate me, associate me with the typic, typical homeschool stereotype. And this stereotype at the time, we met all kinds of people who homeschooled their kids, we met all kinds of people who homeschooled their kids, and um, the stereotype was deserved, quite frankly. This was like 30 years ago, and there were some strange people that homeschooled then. <laughs> and I was afraid that when I was around other people who were not homeschooled, that I would be found out. You know, that I, I would not dress the way that I dressed, or, or laugh at the right time, that I smelled bad in some way. I'd be kind of cast out in, in some way. And many times I actually was. Uh, in fact, I remember um, around high school, like now when you're homeschooled, uh, you can still participate in like the extracurriculars of your local school that you're you know, zoned for. <clears throat> back then, you couldn't. So around 8th, ninth grade, I decided to go back to school uh, so that I could play sports primarily. <clears throat> and I just remember the first day of high school. And um, I was so hyper-observant because what I wanted was for people to think that I was normal. That I just kind of fit in. In fact, it was just this well of pride whenever people would find out that, oh, you, you were homeschooled? I, I wouldn't have thought that. I'm like, oh, yeah, yeah, that's great. Because I so wanted to fit in. <clears throat> nobody wants to be a misfit, right? I mean, nobody wants to be a, a spotted elephant or a Charlie in the box or a train with square wheels on your caboose, or a water pistol that shoots jelly. And if you have no idea what I'm talking about right now, you have a Christmas movie that you need to watch. <laughs> Nobody wants to be from the island of misfit toys. But being a misfit is good practice for a disciple, good practice for future disciples. And the Christmas story, that is the birth of Jesus and the events that happened around it, it's a good reminder of that. So let me back up a little bit. I'm going to back up to where Al had just read for us. Um, there's a story around the birth of Jesus that uh, if we look at it at all, we usually just skim right over it. It's because it's kind of odd. It's just like, what does that even have to do? And it, it, makes us, it might even makes us feel a little bit uncomfortable. Uh, there was a guy named Luke. And Luke was a mostly unbiased Greek doctor 
who uh, investigated many people in Jesus' life and his ministry, uh, and including his birth. He investigated everything, and he wrote it all down. And Luke wrote down a story that happened after Jesus was born, kind of after the, the famous nativity scene, uh, when Joseph and Mary took Jesus, their firstborn, to Jerusalem to consecrate him to the Lord as the firstborn, totally dedicating this child to the Lord. And when they come into the temple, they meet this older man named Simeon. And Simeon had been told by the Lord, by the Spirit within him, that he would live until the Messiah came to Israel. So, I don't know, it has been an incredible experience. Simeon's there at the temple. Joseph and Mary and this young baby Jesus are arriving. And Simeon is moved to go out and look for this child. Now, I don't know if they were standing in some line or they were looking for what line, like what line do I stand in to consecrate my child to the Lord? But Simeon comes up to them and he's like, oh, this is amazing. I can die happy now because I have seen the Lord's Messiah. He's come at last, this baby. And, and he's, he's speaking all this stuff that Al, Al just read. And then he says this, and he gives a prophecy, and this prophecy is just, this is strange. <coughs> then Simeon blessed them, Joseph and Mary and Jesus, and said to Mary, his mother, This child is destined to cause the falling and rising of many in Israel, and to be a sign that will be spoken against. Why? So that the thoughts of many hearts will be revealed. And Mary was taking everything in. Mary was taking all these stories. And it says, Luke had, had talked with her. And she had treasured all these things up in her heart. And then Simeon says this, which I wonder if maybe this was hard to treasure in her heart. <coughs> Simeon said to Mary, And a sword will pierce your own soul too. What? What does that mean? A sword will pierce your own soul too. Maybe Simeon walked away at that point. Joseph and Mary made their sacrifice to the Lord and traveled back to their home. Wondering, a sword will pierce your own soul too. This is, uh, this is odd. I'm sure Mary found this odd, don't you think? You know, as you're leaving the hospital, somebody's like, hey, by the way, this child, a sword's going to pierce your soul. You might find it odd too because around Christmas time, we usually sing about oh, the warmness and, and the peace on earth, right? I heard the bells on Christmas Day. Each refrain, each line ends with, of peace on earth, goodwill to men. Of peace on earth, goodwill to men. I mean, that's usually the focus. And, and the reality is Jesus does give peace. But it's not in the way that we expect. It's not that simple. In fact, later in Luke's recorded account of the events of Jesus' life and ministry, he records in chapter 12 something that Jesus says that seems quite the opposite of what this line is saying. Matthew, one of Jesus' disciples, uh, who was there, it was likely one of the ones that Luke had you know, interviewed to say, like, what, what are all the things that Jesus said? Matthew also records this thing that he says. It's in Matthew chapter 10. If you want to flip over there, you can Matthew remembers a time when Jesus said, Do not suppose that I have come to bring peace to the earth. I did not come to bring peace, but a sword. As I ask you, like, what is this all about? We sing about peace on earth, and yet we so often don't experience it. What is the sword that will pierce the soul of Mary? What is the sword that Jesus came to bring. There's really two parts to understanding this. And um, I want to talk about these two parts, but we're also in a series right now called Underneath the Tree, Four Surprises at the Foot of the Cross. And today I want to share with you the third surprise at the foot of the cross. It's a surprise that I really hope will not be a surprise for those of you who are Jesus followers. For those of you who are young Jesus followers who are growing up, I especially don't want it to be a surprise for you. You're likely experiencing it now on some level and you don't know what to do with it. It's confusing. You're wondering, well, how, do I, how do I manage this? It's a surprise I don't want to be a surprise for you. And I want to share how this, this sword, actually, that we experience in the world 
that we can have the peace that Jesus came to bring in spite of it. Two parts. The first is this. Following Jesus is an all or nothing submission to his will. Following Jesus is an all or nothing submission to his will. But it's not because he's standing there holding a sword over you. You see, Jesus is not just a a wise man or a good teacher who's got some good advice that you can take or leave. And and sadly, that's the way we often treat him. So I'm just like, oh, that's what Jesus said. Oh, this is good. And if it helps me in my life, I'll do it. If it doesn't, well, I'll kind of file that away for later until maybe I'll pull it out and maybe I'll need it. But it's not that way. See, in, in, in the passage that Al read for us, that Simeon says, Jesus is the sovereign Lord. He is the supreme ruler over all things. He's not just a good teacher. He is the supreme ruler over all. That means that full obedience of all people is expected. He he even describes those who do not come with full obedience as like drinking water and spewing it out because it's lukewarm. A a partial rejection of Jesus is a full rejection of Jesus. And all who reject him will be rejected by him. But again, not because he's holding a sword saying, obey me or else. That's not the sword he came to bring. You see, this is the beautiful part about Jesus. The beautiful part about his father is that he will never impose his will on you. He will never force you to be in his presence. He will never force anything on you. It's very different than that. In fact, uh, C.S. Lewis, in a book called The Great Divorce, uh, there's two characters that are interacting, and he explains what is really a beautiful thing about the Lord. And it's a reality still. He says, there are two kinds of people in the end. Those who say to God, thy will be done. And those to whom God says in the end, thy will be done. See, those who are not in the presence of God forever, those that they've chosen to not be in his presence, because he will never force you into his presence. It's an invitation. That's not the sword that he carries. And yet at the same time, for Jesus followers, obedience is absolutely essential in your walk and in your faith. James, the brother of Jesus, and I was paused to talk about him, and, and you may get tired of me saying this all the time if you are here regularly, but it's so important, it's had an impact on my faith. James did not believe that his big brother Jesus was the Messiah until after the resurrection. When Jesus appeared to James and said, James, here I am, the resurrected Messiah. James had previously tried to push his brother into harm's way. And why it's so important for me to point that out is, for those of you with a brother, what would it take for your brother to convince you he was your Lord? Probably a lot. And yet James so believed that Jesus was his Lord that he was willing to give up everything, eventually his own life. He became a leader in the movement, not just in the family business where there was something to gain, but there was everything on earth to lose. The later, James writes to people who were suffering for following Jesus. And he writes this letter, and he calls them out for trying to continue to get what they want, for not fully submitting to Jesus. He says, you adulterous people. It's as if you're in a relationship with your spouse and you want to have this relationship and yet you're still trying to get some on the side. You adulterous people. Don't you know that friendship with the world means enmity against God? Therefore, anyone who chooses to be a friend of the world becomes an enemy of God. Obedience is fully expected of all Jesus' followers. All who reject him, even partially, will be rejected. But those who welcome him will be welcomed as a true son, as a true daughter, as a true brother of Jesus, 
More, more like a brother than any other brotherly relationship. You imagine a good brotherly relationship? It's so much better. He's your true brother. He's your true, you are his true sister. All those who welcome him will be welcomed by him. But this is where the sword comes in. This is the second part. The world hates the sovereignty of God and those who submit to it. The world hates the sovereignty of God and those who submit to it. You see, when you begin to submit yourself fully to the Lord, others, it it attracts their attention. It starts to draw out the ways in which they are not submitting to the Lord. If you're submitting to the Lord and your life is changing, and you're one, and, and, and someone else is, is observing that, it means that there is quite possibly somebody that they should submit to as well. As Simeon drew out in his, his point, he said Jesus would be a sign that would be spoken against. Why? So that the thoughts of many hearts would be revealed. That, that is what the righteousness by faith does. It reveals people's thoughts and heart, the, the thoughts and intentions of their heart. So righteousness that comes by faith, it's a light. And when that light comes on, all of those who are in darkness are blinded by it because they want to keep doing their, the deeds in darkness. They want to continue to do what they're doing hidden where no one can see. So all those who are righteous will be rejected by the world. This rejection is so intense that Jesus tells, this is why I came. This is not often the, the, um, the reason that we dwell on that Jesus came. But listen again to what he says. Do not suppose that I have come to bring peace to the earth. I did not come to bring peace, but a sword. For I have come to turn a man against his father, a daughter against her mother, a daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law, a man's enemies will be the members of his own household. He's quoting from Micah. And then he clarifies what he means by this. He says, anyone who loves their father or mother more than me is not worthy of me. Anyone who loves their son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. Whoever does not take up their cross and follow me is not worthy of me. Whoever finds their life will lose it. Whoever loses their life for my sake will find it. When you try to find your life, it will be taken away because full submission to the Lord is required. But when you lose your life and you fully submit, that is where the peace begins to come in. You see, here's the second, excuse me, the third surprise at the foot of the cross. And I ask you to pay attention really closely if you've zoned out. There will be serious conflict in the relationships and in the heart of the serious Jesus follower. You can count on it. There will be serious conflict in the relationships and in the heart of the serious Jesus follower. You can count on at least a war with yourself. I mean, if you are not experiencing some rejection by the world, either you have so insulated yourself from the world that you're no longer on mission, or you have to ask yourself, am I really following Jesus? Or am I just following some version of my own, my own version of a cultural Christianity? And in this time that we're living in right now, now is a time to take confidence in following Jesus more than ever in your life before. Because Christians are being rejected. Are you? Are you being turned away because of your faith? Or are you insulating yourself? This is the sword that Jesus came to bring. And it's the sword that we all bear. 
And yet, though there is not peace on the earth, and there's many things in the world right now that we might want to be afraid of, we don't have to be. Because Jesus did come to bring peace. But the kind of peace he came to bring only comes through pain. A quote from another uh, C.S. Lewis book. It's one that I read as a child and have gone back to many times. It's part of the Chronicles of Narnia. There is a, um, a character named Eustace. He is a selfish brat. And in the story, he comes across this gold that he only later learns is enchanted. He's taken some of it for himself. He's put a, a band on his arm. And he goes to sleep. He wakes up and he's a dragon. Everyone's terrified of him. He's terrified himself. He begins harming people. And he goes away and he's lonely and he's crying. And with his dragon claws, he begins to claw away at the scales of his, of his dragon flesh. And he's trying so hard to not be a dragon anymore, clawing and clawing. And at first it feels good, but the scales begin to grow back very quickly. So he claws again, and yet they grow again. And it's only until the character that represents Jesus, Aslan the lion, comes. And he takes him down into a pool of water. And he takes his own claws. And he carves through the flesh of the dragon. Eustace later describes the experience when he's become a boy again as extremely painful and yet freeing. This is the kind of sword that pierced Mary's soul. It's like a, a therapist who brings up a painful past so that it can be processed and brought to closure. It's, um, it's like an oncologist who administers chemo and radiation to bring about the health of the body. It's like a heart surgeon who performs a heart transplant to give you a brand new heart. And the only way that you can endure the sword that the world comes to bring, the, the division that we experience in the world, the rejection that we experience in the world, the only way that you can endure that is to understand the sword. Not that Jesus held in his hand, but were truly nails driven into his hands. And it's when you see that he was nailed to a cross because he loves you so much. He really, really loves you so much. That regardless of everything that you've done in your life, and regardless of everything else you've done, the obedience is expected of you. Mercy is continually given morning after morning after morning. If you've not experienced that kind of peace, the peace knowing that you don't just have a heavenly father, he is your father. He loves you and he gives good gifts to you. And though that you are rejected by the world, you are completely accepted by him. If you haven't known that, I want to encourage you to put your trust in him. Will you do that today? Some of you who are here who have just kind of been waiting, kind of been putting on the fence for a while, will you put your trust in him today? Will you come down into the waters of baptism to let the scales of your sinful life totally wash away and be raised up new and born again so that when all of the peoples of all of history are raised up to life, everyone will be raised, some to go on to eternal life and some to a second death. Will you put your trust in him today? I pray that you will. You can either come forward as we sing, or you can come find me or any of our elders or someone afterwards, and we would love to pray with you. Let's pray now. Father, I pray that your sovereignty will become made known in this church.
that we will see you high, lifted up, seated on a throne over all of heaven and earth. Father, knowing that everyone will rise and that every knee will bow and that every tongue will confess that you are Lord. Father, make your sovereignty known so that we can turn to you to repent, to be obedient. Lord, I thank you for your mercy. You are so kind to us. While we were sinning, you you were coming to lay down your life for us. Father, I pray that that will pierce the hearts of everyone here. And then as our hearts grow harder over time, that you will soften it again and remind us that we are truly, deeply loved by you. Let us turn to you. Father, help us to put away the gossip that's in this church. Help us to put away the legalism that's in this church. Father, help us to put away the sexual immorality that's in this church. Help us to put away the greed for career advancement, for money. Help us to put away the gluttony for food, for experiences, for self-indulgence. Help us to put that away, Father. Teach us to follow you to trust in you, knowing that you will provide, that you do give good gifts. And Father, give us peace so that we can go out into this world so that we can even endure lost relationships with people we love, maybe even in our own family, people who are close to us, Give us the peace to know that we are fully accepted by you. And it's in the name of Jesus that we pray all these things. Amen.